This is Technically Legal, a podcast about legal technology, innovation in the legal industry, and the impact tech is having on the law. I'm Chad Main, the founder of Legal Services Company Percipient. Today's show, I talk to Chad Sakonchik. He's one of the founders of Better Legal. That's an app that automates the filing and creation of business formation documents. He tells us how he and his team run a legal tech operation using Bubble, a low-code development platform. Today's guest, Chad Sakonchik, is what you call a serial entrepreneur. After a stint selling computers for Dell right out of college, he launched his first tech company, which was an early entrant in the market that allowed users to create websites. From there, he launched an app that provided food truck owners a platform to take digital orders, and then he launched SpaceSift, which he describes as Airbnb for event spaces. SpaceSift did just fine, but he didn't find startup traction until a few years ago when he convinced a lawyer buddy of his to let him automate the process his friend was using to create LLC documents. Using automation apps like Zapier and project management platforms like Asana and online form apps like Formstack, Chad built out an automation and his friend loved it. It worked so well that the two decided to launch Better Legal. And while they now have graduated to a more sophisticated back end, as we will hear, they built the company on a low and no-code philosophy using platforms like Bubble. After hearing Chad's backstory, you'd think for sure he would end up pursuing a career in the law, but he didn't. While studying film at the University of Texas, he worked as a paralegal for another UT alum, his dad. He worked at his dad's law firm, and after that, he landed a job at an early legal tech company that digitized deposition transcripts. But alas, as we will hear, his heart was just not in pursuing a career as a lawyer. So out of college, I actually went and worked at Dell for a year selling computers. And I've always been in interested in tech. In college, a buddy and I designed websites. I'm not an attorney, but I've been around law for a long time. My dad was an attorney uh. and is an attorney. He's, I don't know if he'll ever retire, <laughs> but so I was essentially in college, his paralegal. He was a solo practitioner. He had a couple of people working for him, but I'm the one that did all of his copies I prepped witnesses since I was at UT and he went to UT law school. I was closer to the law library than he was. And so I went and did research for him. So I do have kind of a lot of just exposure to law. So after Dell, I really wanted to do software. So after one year at Dell, I really wanted to do software, but I didn't exactly know what that meant at the time. And software wasn't as prevalent as it is today where you you know, there used to have so many options. It was 2003 when I graduated from college. So what was your degree in college? Film. Film. And never, law was never something that you wanted to do or you obviously considered it. You had to have considered it, but obviously didn't go that route. Yeah. My dad wanted me to like take over for him. He wanted us to be like dual lawyers. He, he tried to bribe me to take the LSAT. He wanted me to just try to take the LSAT without studying just <laughs> to see how I did just having been exposed to like stuff and having conversations with them and like, again, prepping witnesses or being in depositions and just having been around it for a long time. I just found no interest in it. Uh, I reading stuff. I did an internship with a legal software company in college, actually in, in California, it was called on the record. And they were one of the first like legal tech companies out there where they would take video depositions and I would be the person that would have to take a transcription in a video and link them up. So I would basically watch hours and hours. I would watch like eight hours of depositions a day. And at the end of every line, I had to press space. So the transcript would go to the next line. And so I'd watch the video space, watch the video space, watch the video space. And so that I just had no interest. It was just like, finding a needle in a haystack. And and my dad always found interest in it because he said, you know, by doing the research himself and not pawning it off on associates, which is what a lot of the big law firms do, he was able to find the smoking gun. He knew what he was looking for. But anyway, this on the record company would basically take this tech and, you know, on the old timey movies where they're like, they ask someone on the witness a question and they say something, they go, well, actually, didn't you say this? And then they like, bring it up on the TVs. Like that was the company I worked for where they would have this huge binder of the transcription. They would take a barcode, go to the page that they knew the transcription was. They would scan the barcode, type in the line number, like, okay, we're on page 257, line 13. 
and then they'd be able to bring up that person's depositions live. So again, just so much exposure to law, but I had no interest in doing it just because it was like a lot of work and a little payoff. Anytime I can automate myself out of doing something, I do it. So you have a film degree. How do you end up at Dell then? Are you developing an app at this point or does that come later? The reason I got a film degree was because I couldn't figure out what I wanted my major to be. I wanted to do like tech, but there was Uh really no tech. I actually got a degree technically in convergent media, which was in the film school, which was kind of the philosophy of tech. But I was hanging out with my dad's friends and I asked, I asked them like, what was your degree? What was y'all's degrees? And, and everybody had a degree that was like, not what Uh they did. And they said, honestly, you're at like a major school. You're going to get all of the basic stuff. So just get a degree in something that's interesting to you. And like the degree is the degree. It doesn't really matter what your major is. So I got a major in film and a minor in business. Worked for Dell selling computers. I wanted to do software. Couldn't figure out what I wanted to do. Was living at home with my parents from the ages of 22 to 25. And just saving money so I can do something on my own. And one of my dad's neighbors, one of his friends slash clients, owned a septic tank installation maintenance company. And so that's when I just started working just to make money. So I had money, you know, I didn't have, I didn't have rent. I didn't have anything like that, but just to like have money while I moonlit doing software. So I would basically come home and I hired a guy in India on rentacoder.com, which is now Upwork. It got bought and bought and bought and bought. But rentacoder.com, I found a guy in India who did software development and I just, you know, my nighttime was his daytime. So I would just like kind of go upstairs into the attic and sleep on the futon couch that we had and just turn the the volume up waiting for the AOL and <laughs> the messenger. To like, yeah. bing, bing. And that's when I'd like wake up and I'd go and I'd like talk to the guy and figure out, you know, okay, what's the next step and, and do that. What were you trying to develop at the time? Back then, it was kind of a Squarespace competitor. Squarespace was brand new, and this, and basically, a lot of people were asking me to develop websites, and I was like, "What if I just built a website builder?" Again, like I don't want to do a lot of service-based work. Can I automate myself out of it? And I didn't really even know the Squarespace was around at the time, but I kind of developed something similar. I just wasn't a developer, so I didn't have. I had to pay someone to develop the stuff and design the stuff, so I wasn't able to get as far as I would have liked. But it was a website builder. It was called Posima. So I've had this company since college that I designed websites and do various tech work called Poseidon Imaging. And it was just the first three letters of Poseidon, first three letters of imaging. And so Posima. And I ran that for several years. People used it and people liked it, but it just, you know, never really took off and never went viral or anything like that. I did make the mistake of launching too late. I had a bunch of people that were bloggers that were interested in writing about it. Like Seth Godin had agreed to write about it. Oh, wow. But then I was worried because so many people like small business trends and all these big websites were like, oh yeah, we'll, we'll write a blog post about it. And then I got freaked out that I was not going to be able to handle the volume. And so then I spent another six months automating the sign up because back then Whoa. it wasn't just like having an AWS site. I had a server co-located somewhere. I had to do all of these things. And so I had to automate the setup of the website between three different services plus my co-located server. And By the time I was done, when I reached back out to everybody, they were like, oh, you know what? We're not interested anymore, blah, blah, blah. And so that was my first lesson in launch quickly. And if you have too much demand, just handle it. Right. You know, don't try to develop for having a million customers out of the gate. That's the two schools of thought in company and software development, right? Either move fast and break things or make sure it's perfect before you roll it out, right? In anything... The older I get, the more I realize everybody's right and everybody's wrong. You kind of have to take in all the information and decipher what is the best strategy for you at that time for that product. So yes, you can plan ahead and launch it and be perfect, or you can do this. It's like, what, what are you doing? Is it something that will benefit from having an iterative process? Out of everything that I've done, I have learned more that Sometimes when I develop something, when I explain it to someone, they just don't get it. Right. And it's, I don't know whether I'm not explaining it right or they're not understanding me. It doesn't matter, but they just don't get it. It's not until I show someone 
what it looks like and how it works that like the light bulb goes off. So I, I prefer to like get something raw out there just to like get their wheels spinning. And then they start feeding me ideas and what can it do this? I need this. I need this. So that's the way I prefer to go. And now with no code and all this stuff, I kind of have a perfect system now that's been, you know, being developed over 20 years where I now just will launch something and launch and iterate and iterate. And if we start building to something where we just have to scrap everything that we started with, that's fine because we can move so fast now. Let's just like throw the old thing out, rebuild it in the new way that we would have built it the first time. How do we know what we know now? And with just the amount of resources and ease of use that is available now, it's easier to just throw things away and start over once you kind of have some traction. So you started over, you've got the SaaS company going to help you build websites. Maybe the timing wasn't right. So what do you do next? You launch another app or do you go work at the software company? No, I went and I worked for a company called Pervasive, which was a, back then it was called an integration company. There was no such thing as an automation company. It was an integration company. It was a database company. And so they basically built a tool that allowed you to connect to a bunch of different databases, a bunch of different APIs. And you would have to like have a WYSIWYG, a flow chart, in order to build stuff. And then they had their own programming language for doing bespoke things. It was very much like what Integromat make is today, but for more technical people. And back then there just weren't as many APIs readily available. So it was a lot more just like getting into the database itself. So they had this custom tool and they wanted to start doing this turnkey software. And so I worked for a Skunk Works team that basically integrated Salesforce and QuickBooks. And that kind of was a mini tiger by the tail because a lot of people use QuickBooks and Salesforce was growing and Salesforce was trying to go down market to get these smaller businesses, but they already had all their information in QuickBooks and these salespeople were like telling them about, oh, you just put your information to, into Salesforce. And the people were like, then I'm going to have to put in QuickBooks. I already put in QuickBooks. Why do I need your software? So that's when I got brought in a lot because we would migrate all of their QuickBooks data into Salesforce during the 30 day free trial. And so people got to see their actual data in Salesforce and use it for real and see that, oh, wow, now that I put something in Salesforce, and I market closed one, it now creates an invoice or a uh, sales order in QuickBooks, the light bulb went off. So I, that, I was exposed to literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Salesforce reps just bringing me in on their calls to the point where I, I would go into the Salesforce office and security would see me so often that they thought I was a, <laughs> of an employee at Salesforce. Like I lived in Austin. I would fly to either the New York or the San Francisco office once a month and I would just work there for a couple of days. They just had an open desk for me. And I'd get on calls and I just, just learned a lot about small businesses in general and how they worked and how they thought. And the funniest part of it is that every small business thinks that they're unique and none of them are. <laughs> they're like, well, we're different because and it's like, let me stop you right there. No, you're not. You're, you sell something, you have customers, you have marketing, you have sales, you have accounting, like you're the same. There's the thing you sell is different. The infrastructure of the business is the exact same as every other business. So I worked for Pervasive for about six, seven years and we integrated with, you know, like I said, Salesforce QuickBooks, Salesforce NetSuite. Mind body QuickBooks. We had a bunch of different kind of off the shelf buy a subscription type direct connections. And that's when Zapier started kind of becoming big. But that was way before they had multi step zaps. They were just like one point to one point. And I remember just getting into arguments with management and saying, like, this is what I've been talking about. Like, instead of developing Salesforce QuickBooks, why don't we just make like Salesforce as an endpoint, QuickBooks as an endpoint? Excel is an endpoint. Google Sheets is an endpoint. And then people can connect to whatever they want. And I never got any traction. People were like, no, nobody wants to build anything. They just want the connection. And then Zapier started, you know, making some moves. We should point out Zapier is a piece of software that allows you to connect various apps that you use every day. Like the stuff you didn't talk about. Connecting Google Sheets to QuickBooks and vice versa. Yeah, it's basically an automation tool where it's like step one, get the data from here. Step two, manipulate the data a little bit. Step three, get some more data from over here. Step five, manipulate the data a little bit and then push it over there and then maybe push it back. So like a build your own automation tool. No one at Pervasive really just figured it out. We ended up getting acquired by kind of a holding company. So everybody on my team got laid off. We all just, you know, 
kind of acquire and fire. And after that, I taught myself how to code. And so I tried to build my own, like, basically what it ended up becoming like Uber Eats or Toast Tab, where I would build, and it was made for food trucks, really, where you could basically, like, go to the website, pick what you wanted, order it and pay, and then just walk up to the window and grab it instead of having to, like, wait in line, order. And it was mainly for, like, because we used to wait in line at pervasive at the food truck. We had an hour for lunch. We'd go outside. There'd be one or two food trucks. We wait in line for 20 minutes, wait another 20 minutes for our food, eat. And then our whole lunch hour is done waiting around. So I was like, I want to make it easier to where if like, you know, you're going somewhere, just order pay and then just pick it up. I heard you say that the, to me, the layoff, you taught yourself to code and design this app. I heard you say somewhere else that the reason you started to think about this and, and, wanted to code and develop these other companies is because you wanted to control your destiny. You didn't want to have to have someone else be able to lay you off again. You wanted to choose your own adventure. The problem is when you take investors and your investors become board members, you got the same problem. Right. So same conflicts, people that don't work in the business every day that say you should do this or you should do that. And that's a challenge as well, because, you know, the people who are investing in you, they have money because of some reason where they can influence your decision and maybe they're right sometimes, maybe they're wrong a lot, but like you, again, going back to what I said before, you got to take in as much information as possible to make a decision. Now the person on the other end needs to be just as flexible and say like, okay, well, you know, I'm giving you this idea, but I understand that you're the operator of the business and we need to ultimately give you the runway to handle the business because you understand it because I'm not in the business every day. You are. So I'm going to leverage you as the individual to make the decision. So yeah, that's been a constant thing. And ultimately one day I want to be the person that makes the decision. But even then, even then, and this is just a maturity thing I think for me is even if I just tell developers or people that work for me what to do, they have their own opinions. And if I'm now the boss and people that are working in the business every day are telling me something their customers are saying, or they're telling me they can't develop something because of this or that or reason, that's different friction from somewhere else. And so you're never going to just get to tell people what to do all the time and never have friction. And People just need to understand that and they need to understand that they need to be more flexible and be more in a negotiating mood and say, okay, I see it this way. You see it this way. Let's figure out like what the reasonable thing to do is. And then let's get some data on it. Like let's move on something. Let's get some data before we make any big rash decisions. That's going to cost a lot of money or a lot of development or a lot of time. Let's get something out there, see what it looks like. If it's not showing any life, pull it. If it's got some traction, pour some gasoline on it. And so there's always going to be flex in who you're dealing with. There's a lot to that. I don't know. Like, I know I'm kind of like zipping around in a bunch of different things, but like, there's no such thing as being your own right. boss. It doesn't exist. Bob Dylan says everybody's got to answer to someone. Yeah. But you make this jump, you build the, the food app. Obviously, the napkin. Do you then move to Space Sift? Is that the next app you build? Or what, what happens to the food app? How do you get to Space Sift? I was doing Restless Napkin and it just wasn't really working out. There was a company in Austin called Favor that ended up getting bought by HEB, which is our big grocery store here. But they basically built what I built, but they had like delivery drivers. So I got done with Restless Napkin. And I moved over to Space Sift. I actually worked for a driver's ed company for a little bit, helping them in like a tech driver's ed, like a mobile app uh, called Aceable. Worked for them for about a year. After that, then I started Space Sift. And it was basically like Airbnb for event spaces. And what year is this? What year do you launch Space Sift? 2013, maybe. Worked on that for like two years, two solid years. Sold my house, was like, okay. I can't keep doing this, like have a full-time job and like try to moonlight this thing. Like I need to dedicate it. I need to feel a sense of urgency. And so I sold my house and I had a couple years runway and started building space. Sift. started getting a little bit of traction, 
but the problem was I was selling this software to like bars and restaurants and I was selling like a $99 a month SaaS on just like event management. You would charge the venues the $99 fee. Yeah, to manage it. So like it automated leads. It had a form on their website, automated leads, got the people who requested, is it available and answer quickly. And it worked really, really well. The problem was my customers were not very tech savvy. They were just worried about like what's in front of them. Like we got this happening this weekend. I've got to restock the bar. I've got to make sure that my bartenders aren't stealing from the, you know, the kitty, blah, 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 blah. And they'd have a change in GM or whatever. And I'd have to resell the software to people I've already sold it to. They're like, what's this $99 a month? And I have to like go back in and talk to the new guy and explain what it was. And that's kind of when like my buddy had gone solo and he was complaining about his lack of law business. He was on Avo up council, all these places, and he was just not getting a lot of business like he thought he was going to. And we talked about it. it. Turns out he was charging $1,500 for an LLC. And I was like, why are you charging so much? The state of Texas costs $300. And he goes, well, you know, I make $300 an hour and three hours of my time to set it up plus a $300 fee. And I'm like, well, why does it take you three hours? Like, first of all, why are you charging $300 an hour? And second of all, why does it take you three hours? And he's like, well, they come into my office and I talk to him about like, how they want the distribution to be and this and that. And then it takes me like an hour to fill out the operating agreement. And I'm like, Hey, if someone knows that they want all these things, they're going to know about it and they're going to tell you, but the people that just are setting up a business, maybe they're a sole proprietor and they just want that legal protection a little bit. And they just want that like separate bank account. They just want to get it set up and go just give them something generic. And what I kind of found out is that a lot of these documents are just from Westlaw or like a continuing education course. And then it's just kind of modified. Well, I can just take that template and then just fill in the blanks and make it easier. So we took this like three hour process and turned it into like a 10 minute process. And so then he started selling LLCs for $299 plus the state filing fee. And is this still through his law firm predates Better Legal? So Better Legal didn't exist at this point. And we kind of made an agreement that like, okay, well, let's see if people are interested in this and you take two ninety nine, and you'll get to keep half. And then our joint venture will get to keep half. So out of the two ninety nine, like he gets to keep one, one fifty, we get to keep one forty nine, And like as a core, as a joint group after about a year, we did like 50 of them and it was all automated. I, I basically spent like a month with Zapier and WebMerge and Asana and stuff. And I automated it to be really easy. But then, you know, he was asking, he was like, hey, this is, here's an issue here, or this is taking me too long to do this. And so I modified it over the course of the year to where it's very automated and very easy for him to use. And then that's when we were like, okay, well, let's try to sell this to attorneys. Attorneys wanted nothing to do with it. Attorneys were like, oh, you want to take away my hourly rate? And they're like, no, thank you. When we come back in just a couple of minutes, Chad tells us about building better legal. I'm Chad Main, and you're listening to Technically Legal. This podcast is brought to you by Percipient, a legal services company powered by technology. Percipient helps legal teams tackle legal operations, electronic document review, and process automation. Percipient services include managed document review, subpoena compliance, cyber incident response, and also helps legal teams provide clients with process-driven legal support. To learn more, visit percipient.com. CO, Percipient, legal services powered by technology. We'll get back to my conversation with Chad Sikonchik in just a second, but before we do, just want to let you know if you go to tlpodcast.com, there's a dedicated episode page for this episode and all other episodes on the show. On those pages, you'll find more information about our guests, how to get a hold of them, and links to some of the stuff we talk about. If you like what you're hearing, number one, I appreciate you listening. I thank you for dedication. And number two, if you want to subscribe, you can find us on all major podcast platforms. And while you're there, if you're so inclined, please leave us a review. All right, let's get back to my conversation with Chad Sikonchik. He's just about to tell us how he and a buddy built Better Legal. So what you've created here is an app that allows people to organize LLCs. It automates that process. And in a fraction of the time, fraction of the cost, 
and you're getting good uh, traction from it, but you go to lawyers and they don't like it because it takes for the billable hour. I talked to dozens and dozens and dozens of attorneys. I was turned away at every I'm sure you were of the way. And you know, what the wrestling I had to make with my buddy was that I could automate. And he's like, no. And it just like, because we were so close, I got to like push him over the edge after like weeks and weeks of discussing it. And then once we started making money and once he started seeing that like, oh, wait a minute, it takes me 10 minutes and I make two ninety nine right. versus three hours at $300 an hour for this data entry work. He was like, this is way better. He was like, I don't like doing this anyway. Right. This isn't like hot quality lawyer work and I'm still charging $300 an hour for it. And he's like, or this thing that's automated and I still get $300 for it. And I was like, I know. And so we kept telling lawyers that and they just did not care. They're like, well, that day takes me a few minutes. And we're like, yeah, but it takes you a few minutes to do this. It takes you a few minutes to do this. Then it takes you a few minutes. And then it like stacks up and now it's like a couple of hours and you're just passing that fee back on to the client and the client might pay it or the client might say, mm, I'm going to go to legal zoom, better legal ink file, whatever. And so like lawyers are losing this battle because they think, and I don't want to piss anybody off, but here's the reality. Here's what like customers think. I get that you got a law degree. If you're doing data entry work, I'm not paying you $300 an hour to do data entry work. Do lawyer work for $300 an hour. Don't do data entry work for $300 an hour and try to tell me that there was like all this stuff involved. And I know there's more to it. There's always more to it. But the point being, you could automate a lot of that process and then the lawyer does the actual more to it, the stuff that may not be automated. And this is the thing. My buddy got more clients by doing this because he's in one year, he set up 50 LLCs because his price was so low. And it was very hands-off. It only took him 10 minutes to do because it was so automated. And then he had 50 new clients. And so at what point does the light bulb go out for him? It's already gone off for you. What point does it go off for him? And he says, let's create better legal. Oh, man. The first LLC, he was like, time me. I'm going to do this. And it took him like nine minutes and 37 seconds. And he's just was like, <laughs> I can't believe I was doing this manually. He was like, I can't believe it. And then when the money started rolling in, he was like, we've got thousands and thousands of dollars that we've made without doing that much actual physical work. So then he was like, let's sell this to attorneys. And, and he tried to sell it to attorneys. I tried to sell it to attorneys. He tried to sell it to attorneys. So his perspective of saying like, I am living proof that this works. And they just didn't care. We spent a year developing a white label system. So lawyers could sell it like that. And we just got nowhere. Like nobody wanted it. Um, I literally had a firm call hundreds, like 900 attorneys in the state of Texas to like pitch them this or like find out all their information. Like, how do you file an LLC? Blah, 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 blah. And go through the whole process. And then we followed up with some emails. We kind of like ghost called them. We phantom called them as a fake client just to get this information from them. And then we followed up with like, hey, we know that you charge this. We know blah, 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 blah. We have a white label software that will help you do this. Zero people cared. Wow. So then you decide to take it basically B to C, the consumers, take it to the clients. We just put it on Google and Google ads. And so we spent $1,200 on Google ads. We got two sales. So at, at $299, we got $600. So that was 50% back. And we're like, all right, well, with the very low budget site that we have now that looks terrible, people gave us their $599, including state filing fee, their social security and their credit card. That's validation. And so that's when we put a lot of effort making the site look nicer, making the flow work better. Tell me about the tech stack you were using, you created for your buddy. You mentioned Asana, Zapier. I think you mentioned Formstack, which is one of the reasons that's what piqued my interest when uh, to get you on the podcast. Because when I started my company, I remember we had several Zaps and Formstack was on that front end. Now it's, it's way more sophisticated now. but So it started off as just like a front end website, like a static website, which could have been like Wix right. or Weebly. It could have been literally anything. And then Typeform, so they filled out yep. Typeform and then connected to Stripe, which then sent the order to uh, Asana. And then Zapier automated the legal doc creation through Web Merge. We ripped out Asana and replaced it with Salesforce because I was already paying for Salesforce for Space Sift, but they were charging like $4,000 a year. And so that's when I, at the end of that year, we started custom code 
and migrated everything to custom code. Now, since then, in 2022, I did a, after five years of custom code, I did a major migration to Bubble, which is my new best friend. So now our tech stack is basically Bubble. Explain what Bubble is. It's low slash no code interface. If anybody's old, old enough like me and remembers Dreamweaver or Microsoft front page, it's like that, but to build apps. So it's like you get to drag around your design and make it look the way you want it. But then like when you click a button, it's like, okay, well, what do you want this button to do? It's like, I want this button to call Zapier and give it this information. And then you can like do your thing. Or you like when someone clicks this button, I want it to like charge their credit card. And so it adds that layer of like logic that they're, I think the best in class out of all the no-code solutions, like they figured out the logic part of it. Now, Webflow, which is a web design software, is trying to figure out the logic, whereas like Bubble figured out the logic first and then that now going to the design. But I do everything in Bubble now, 100% Bubble. Bubble's the main character. And then we have a bunch of like supporting characters, which, you know, we've got a bunch of software that, but, that does a bunch of different stuff. Some of it's built out custom. Some of it is, you know, third-party software, all kinds of stuff. So you started with your own kind of Franken stack with Zapier and form stack web merge. Huh. So then you you decide to go direct to the consumer, clean up your website. Then you started coding your own app there. So where did you find the developers there? Upwork. And so you did that for a while. What year do you move to Bubble? 2022. 2022. And then and then what happened to the code? Are you still using some of it? I threw it out, man. Yeah. It's hanging out with uh, Oscar the Grouch. And so everything's in Bubble now. You, you, you have no, you yes. have no custom code. We have some custom code, but it's more like they're modules that get called when necessary. Like it's like the cloud. The data is not really in right. the cloud. Right. It's at a center somewhere and it's called the cloud. No code just means that like the code is hidden away from you under an interface. And so like no code has its limitations and the way to get around its limitations is by coding something. And that might just be a, a little script, you know, like we've got like something very simple, like I need to take full state names and convert them to the two letter codes. Now, how do I do that? There's no software that just does it magically. So you have to write that code out or grab it from, you know, a free repository on GitHub and that's Python. And then you plug it into, we use a piece of software called the masonry that is kind of like an, a little stationary place that you put code. Basically, we have something that we have a code block that converts state names to the two letter code that's put in the masonry. And we just call that code whenever we need it. And that block processes it on its own. Interesting. And so right now, as you were in the beginning, you help customers form LLCs and business entities. What's the plans for the futures? Are you going to move into other types of legal documents? Where are you going? One of the things with Better Legal was we weren't really legal tech. We generated legal documents for people, but they, we generated legal documents from a template. There was nothing really, we we're in a very commoditized business. Right. You know, it's very difficult to compete with companies that just have either 20 years in public money because they IPO'd or have 200 plus million dollars because they raised it from VCs. Like it's hard to compete with those companies because they have a lot of money to spend on ads. Now they lose a lot of money and we are officially, as of this month, when we did the books for the end of June, we were profitable trailing 12 months. So we're not a big company, but we're a profitable company. And so we're going to make it through this economic environment while innovating. And we have already released what is called Better Legal Assistant, which is nothing more than a Chrome extension that simplifies complicated text. And so if you're reading a contract, you're like, oh, what does this paragraph mean? Like this is written so in such a convoluted way. You can just paste it into our Chrome extension and it simplifies it to the level of like a 10 year old could understand it. And we've had over a thousand explanations already. I've seen like, you know, where users are from and we've already got some like UCLA law students using yeah. it. I've used it a ton with uh, just reading a contract, like a contract that is like three pages and it's like, I'm already, my brain's already kind of fried for the day. And it's like, oh, I, I got to read this before I sign it though, you know? And so I just like, I copy it. I copy a paragraph and I paste it into the Chrome extension and like spits it out. So I just go paragraph by paragraph. And I'm, so I'm just much more educated. I've got a buddy that does some stuff for Apple and 
was given an Apple purchasing agreement, I ran his whole document through it and basically said, here's basically what it said. He used that knowledge to then go in with his attorney, see what his attorney said, and his attorney said the same thing as the AI. And so he was like, okay, the lawyer's not trying to like just kick up a bunch of dust. He's like giving me some like legit stuff and, and it agrees with the AI. And the AI helped augment my knowledge of this. So that's step one. Phase two we're working on right now which is a full contract analysis tool. And it goes through six steps. And the first step is it just extracts all the elements out of the contract. A big problem with contracts is they are hidden, like important information is hidden in one to 10 page, single type page documents, right? So it's like, who are the players? How much money is there? What are the dates? When are the terminations? What is being sold or exchanged? It's all hidden. It's all hidden in there. So- First step is just extract that information and just like, here are the parties, here's the dollars, here's the dates, here's all the relevant information. Step two is the analysis of the contract. It goes through the requisite elements of a contract, you know, what's consideration, what's this the stuff. And it educates the user, it says, this is what it's going to look at. And then it says like, this is mutual consent. This is consideration. And it educates the customer on what that stuff is and how the contract talks about that. Then step three is balance. It says whether the contract is balanced on both sides. Step four is scenarios. It provides you scenarios on how the contract can negatively affect you if left unchanged. That move gets moved to considerations. Considerations are, okay, you didn't like scenario two and scenario four. Let's talk about scenario two and scenario four and what you might consider in order to fix it to make it more fair for you. And then step six is options. It's like, okay, you didn't like scenario two, scenario four. We went over the considerations. Here are options on how you can change the contract yourself. If you don't like this, you can put something like this in this section, and then they can do that themselves. And so that's what we're working on right now. And that that's going to be basically a full-on new SaaS tool that we release. Nice. What's one thing or even a couple of things that you learned and you would you could only have learned by building these businesses that if a kid just out of college, your younger self comes to you right now and says, hey, give me some advice about building a tech company. What, what would you tell them? What would you, what would you tell that person? What would you tell the younger you? Sell something you haven't built yet. To validate the idea? Validate the idea. I'm doing that right now with something else. Tell people what you're building and then get them in a conversation and then show them something. Like you can do it manually on the back end. You don't have to show them beautiful UI and a company with branding and stuff. You can do it in the back and then you can start doing stuff. And that's how I validated Better Legal Assistant was I was talking to people about like, hey, how do you use contracts, blah, blah, blah. And they would send me contracts and then I would like run it through the AI manually and then I'd send them something back. And then they tell me what they liked and didn't like about it. By the 10th time I did that for someone, I had a process and I was giving them, I was running the same prompts for people. And I was getting like great feedback. And I was like, this is the business. Everybody's giving me a different contract. They do something different. They have different needs, but I run it through the same analysis and it helps them understand their contract better. That's the business. And everybody says, this is awesome. And then you build it because you already have an audience of people that have told you that they want it, have given you some concrete stuff and you've like, exchanged goods in a way where you've given them something and they've given you feedback. And then you've got a small group of people that you can be your initial customers once you actually launch for real. So it's really just like, stop assuming you're the smartest guy (laughs) in the room and don't say like, oh man, if I built this, everybody's going to want to use it. You're wrong. You're wrong. (laughs) Right. Well, Chad, I appreciate your time. People want to get a hold of you personally or they want to learn more about Better Legal. Where do you want to send them? My Twitter is just C-S-A-K-O-N. The first letter of my first name and the first five letters of my last name is my handle. And that's where I talk very openly about a lot of stuff and people can reply to me or DM me and I'm available. Okay, that's a wrap for today's episode. As always, we really appreciate you listening. If you want to subscribe, you can find us on most major podcast platforms like Apple, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, etc. 
Also, if you like us enough, I hope you leave us a favorable review. Thanks again for listening. Until next time, this has been Technically Legal.